All righty, let us get started. <clears throat> so today's plan is to continue uh, discussing uh, thermodynamics, but uh, we will be moving on to the next topic, uh, probably the final topic uh, for this subject, which is going to be the heat transfer by radiation. So last time in the last few classes, uh, we discussed how heat can be transferred by means of conduction, which is when two objects are in physical contact with each other. They're in physical contact, the molecules of the two materials are vibrating, depending on their energy, how much heat they have, the more heat, the more they vibrate. And these vibrating molecules will uh, bump and run into the molecules of the other material. And in doing so, will uh, give off or transfer some of their kinetic energy to the other material. And in doing so, that new material now has more energy than it had before. Thus, you've heated it up. You've transferred some of the heat energy from one material to another. Now, uh, this method, radiation, is different. Um, if we want to try to have a uh, conceptual view of how the heat will be transferred by radiation or, or visualize it, the way we do it is this. Now, before I, I talk about it, I have to say what I'm about to talk about or show or draw is not the true reality of the universe. Okay, this is just a model. This is a way of helping us as humans visualize what's going on. But of course, the more we learn about how atoms work and, and electrons and all of that stuff, the more we realize that our original models, while they help us understand, uh, are not really what's going on in here. And you'll see what I mean. Firstly, uh, the big model we talk about is an atom can be thought of as a nucleus with uh, some electrons orbiting around uh, this nucleus, kind of like planets orbiting around a sun. Okay, and one thing we know, if we follow this model, is that there are very specific orbitals or energy levels these electrons can be in. So an electron can't have any energy at once. It has to have one of a series of particular discrete energy. Okay. Um, that's kind of what quantum mechanics talks about. Quantum mechanics, when you get into that field, is all about how there's not this continuous view of the universe, but rather it's discrete, it's quantized. It can have this value or this value, but not in between. This is a very foreign concept to us because of course, you think of anything in the universe, think of anything uh, like the position of a, of a baseball. If I put a baseball somewhere on the table, it's at a particular location. Well, I can move the baseball anywhere I want. It can have any position just by me moving it around. But what quantum mechanics would say is that's not really true. Actually, it could be in this spot or this spot, but it can't be in a spot in between those two places. Now, we don't see that in our everyday lives because the, the effects are so small uh, that we can't, we can't even detect them in our, with our eyes or our ears or our senses. Um, but on this small scale of atoms and particles, this stuff becomes important. And so an electron, which is orbiting the nucleus, can be either in the first orbit or the second orbit or the third orbit. And it has to have one of those orbits. Can't be somewhere in between. And which orbit it's in, of course, depends on how 
highly energetic the electron is. Generally speaking, everything wants to be as lazy as possible, have as little energy as possible, and sit down or lay down at the lowest energy level. So when you have an atom, naturally, its electrons are going to be shoved down to the lowest energy level possible. However, you can energize, you can excite these electrons, and in doing so, move an electron from one orbit to another. And so it'll be at a higher energy state. Okay, you have excited it. Now, how did you do it? You had to feed it some energy to make it go from the lower energy state to the upper energy state. How much energy did you feed it? Well, that's what's nice about this. The energy to go from level one to level two is a certain amount of energy. And every electron that's in this first energy state, this first orbital, if it wants to get to the second one, you give it this exact amount of energy and it'll get up to that new energy level. And it's always this number, you know, whatever it is, uh, 50 joules or something, who cares what it is. Now I'm putting this symbol gamma, Greek letter gamma to stand for energy because usually the way the energy is either absorbed by the electrons or given off is in the form of light. Light is how energy is transferred by these particles. And the energy of the light means its color, its frequency. So if you have a very high energy light, then you may be having gamma waves or ultraviolet light. If you have very low energy, maybe you're talking about radio waves or microwaves or something like that. And of course, there are some times where the energy is just the right amount of uh, uh, energy such that we can actually see the light, that it's in the visible spectrum. But uh, no matter what type of light it is, radio, gamma, visible, it doesn't matter. It's all light. It's just energy. It's just that how much energy is possessed by this light its frequency, we have classified into different names, radio waves. And so in our minds, we imagine radio waves as being something different than the light that comes from a light bulb. But it's not, it's the same thing. It's just that radio waves are lower energy than the visible light we can see from a light bulb. But either way, it's made of the same stuff, it's just light. So every time you want to move an electron from a low energy to a higher energy state, you give it a certain amount of light, a certain amount of energy. And it's always that same amount for a particular atom, a type of atom. Now, what obviously happens, since I told you in this universe, everything wants to be at the lowest energy state possible, everything's lazy then eventually, if you wait long enough and you don't have to wait all that long, what will happen is this excited electron will again drop back down to the lower energy state because it doesn't like being excited. But in doing so, it must give off its extra energy. If it wants to be at the low energy state, it can't have this extra energy. So it gives it away and it sends away this piece of light at whatever this energy difference is. So if it's in the first energy state and you want to get it to the second, you have to add 10 joules. It's absorbed 10 joules by heat, by fire, or whatever you're doing. And now it's excited running around the atom at the higher energy state. Gets bored. It wants to drop back down again, take a nap in the low energy state. It sends off light. The, the energy of that light is that amount of energy that you gave it to begin with. Okay. And that's what radiation is. It's nothing more than the electrons in these atoms being excited and then dropping back down to their lower energy state. And in doing so, giving away that extra energy for other things to absorb it. Maybe there's another atom out here with his electrons running around. And maybe this electron here absorbs this light coming in and it moves that electron out to his higher energy state and so on. This is what radiation is. And it just so happens that if 
the light that is sent off by these electrons is high enough energy, then it's in the infrared spectrum, which is just a little bit less than visible light. And thus it's what we call heat energy or what we classify as heat. So that's kind of the visual conceptual view of how radiation works. Obviously this is different, sort of different from the other term radiation we think of. This radiation is purely light sent off by these excited electrons, okay? The other radiation that most people are used to talking about is radiation because of nuclear activity, radioactivity, okay? That radiation is different. That radiation, there's different types. They all have to do with happens in the nucleus. The electrons play no role at all, okay? It's all about the nucleus for that type of radiation. And different things can happen to the nucleus. It could split apart into pieces. It could fuse two different nuclei together to make a new nucleus. Either way, when that happens, things are sent out. Sometimes it's energy in the form of gamma rays, light. Sometimes it's electrons or antimatter, positrons. Sometimes it's other pieces of nucleus. And those things we call radiation, radioactive particles. That's a different story. So don't, when we, when we discuss radiation here for thermodynamics, don't confuse it with the nuclear uh, version of radioactivity and radiation that kind of gets you sick or whatever. Okay, that's just a different effect. It happens to have the same name. What we were talking about here is energy that's absorbed or given off while electrons are being excited or dropping down to their lower energy state. Okay. Now, once we have this physical interpretation of what's going on, fine. What we actually want, of course, is how to analyze problems. What kind of problems are we going to get where we have to calculate stuff? We have to predict things. Well, what we want to try to analyze is basically the same type of thing we did with conduction. Given a material, it's at some temperature. So you've heated it up to some temperature. The electrons are excited. And those electrons will eventually try to drop down, giving off light. And we, we want to know is how much energy per second, so the heat transfer rate, is given off because of radiation. Now, this equation is different than the conduction one, obviously, because it's a different mechanism. But we're still solving for the same thing, the amount of energy transferred per second. This time it's given by this equation. I'll write the equation down and then tell you what the uh, variables are. Sigma, that's a Greek letter, sigma. Epsilon, kind of a curvy backward or curvy E. Uh, A, capital A, T to the fourth power. There's my equation. Now, of course, this is completely meaningless if I don't tell you what the heck these variables stand for. So first, Q over T, we have been calling this the heat transfer rate when we discuss uh, conduction, but it has another name. And usually this other name is what we call it when we discuss radiation. It's still the heat transfer rate, but there's a secondary name we could call it. And that name is the power. Because one thing you learn in uh, physics is when you talk about energy and work from first semester physics, one thing you could do is say, okay, I built a machine and this machine does this much work per second. Okay. Well, that is called the power of the machine. A more powerful machine can do more work in the same amount of time as a less powerful machine. Power is nothing more than how much work or how much energy per second. So a lot of times we think about uh, a star. A star is a very, very hot object. 
because of its immense heat, its immense excited state, it's giving off a bunch of energy by radiation. And so we can ask how powerful is the star? What kind of power is it radiating out to the, to the earth? What we mean is the heat transfer rate, but people like to call it power. And just so you know, the units of joules per second, which we've been using for heat transfer rate, is the same as being called capital W, which is watts, W-A-T-T-S, watts. So you may have heard of these units when it comes to things like sound systems or uh, electronics or things like that. You say, uh, oh, uh, my uh, receiver uh, puts out uh, 2000 watts per channel or whatever. And what it's telling you is how powerful, how much energy is consumed or used per second. More power, more energy per second. And so sometimes instead of calling it joules per second, we just call it watts. So that's Q over T, the same Q over T from before, but now sometimes we'll just call it power. Sigma, that's a new guy. Sigma, is what's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So just as is true for a lot of physics equations, because we use human units in our equations, the numbers usually won't come out right. So we fix the numbers by plugging in a constant somewhere. When we talk about gravity, we use capital G. When we talk about electricity, we use K. There's usually some constant we have to plug in to fix our units, to fix the numbers, because the universe doesn't care about meters and seconds. That's human stuff. But since we use them, and we have to use them, in order to make the numbers come out to the correct answer, we have to convert everything at the end of the day and that's what these constants do for us, okay? We don't think of it like that. It's just a number we plug into our equation, but that's really what it's for. It's nothing more than a number you multiply your answer by at the end of the day to fix everything to have the right units. What is the number? 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight. This is actually fairly easy to remember. If we look at the numbers, five, six, seven, eight, that's all it is. 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight, okay? Next term, epsilon. Epsilon is what's called the emissivity. This is that number that tells you about the material you're talking about. Just like with conductivity, you can have aluminum, may give rise to more heat conduction than something like a piece of wood. Wood doesn't transfer heat as easily as metal. And so if we're talking about uh, trying to figure out how much heat will be transferred per second, then obviously we need to know about what material we're talking about. And so this term emissivity, epsilon, is the term for this equation. And what it says is how easily does this object radiate its energy. So you may have, for instance, uh, a, a metal sphere that you put to a thousand degrees, very, very hot, and it'll radiate a certain amount of energy. But then you may get some other material uh, and you get that material to a thousand degrees as well, and it doesn't radiate as much energy per second. So different materials can radiate more or less easily. And this number tells you how easily your material radiates. Now, what you need to know is it's always a number between zero and one, okay? One means it radiates 100%. It's a perfect radiator. Perfect radiator. That's one. Okay. Otherwise, you may have a material that radiates at 55%. That would be 0.55. 0.55. Okay. 
or a 70% radiator, that's 0.7. So it's always a number between zero and one where one is a perfect radiator. It sends out its energy perfectly. All the energy you give it, it can give away again. Other materials, of course, in reality are not perfect. And so you may give it a whole bunch of energy, but some of it is gonna keep for itself and only a little bit of it will it radiate away. Okay, that's what epsilon does. A, capital A, is the surface area of the material. And so if you remember with conduction, conduction, we talked about the area of the thing trying to send energy through. So if you have a window and it's a really large window, then there's more places for the energy to pass through than if it's a small window. Well, same kind of a thing here. If you have an object that you heat up, the only places where energy can leave the object is from its surface. If you think about a star, a star is a big sphere, for instance. There's my sphere. Well, there's hydrogen gas all over it from the inside to the outside, let's say. And the inside is where all the nuclear fusion is happening, heating up the whole star. But the light from the star is coming from its surface. So it's the surface that's sending off the radiation. The inside, which is creating all the heat, well, that light meets another piece of material, another molecule, almost instantly. As soon as it leaves, it hits another piece of the star and it's absorbed by that piece. And then it leaves and it hits another piece of the star until eventually it gets to the outside surface. Once it gets to the outside surface, when it leaves, it leaves the star and that's what radiates away. So when we go to calculate how much energy is radiated from a material, from some object, then obviously what's important is how big of an area, how much surface is there for the light to actually escape. So we don't care about the volume or the radius or the diameter, what we care about is the surface area. Now, what does that mean in practicality? That means whatever shape the object is that we're trying to discuss, you have to be able to figure out how to calculate the surface area of that shape. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you now, you're only gonna to need to know about two shapes, a sphere, like a star, or uh, a cube, a box. So if we have a sphere, let's say it's a metal sphere or it's a star or something like that, the formula to calculate the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared, okay? Remember, we're not talking about volume. Volume is four thirds pi r cubed. This is not volume. This is just the surface area. How much surface is there? And it's given by this calculation. So if I tell you, you have a star of radius 50,000 kilometers, then you can calculate its surface area. You know, the radius converted to meters, then four times pi times the radius squared gives you the surface area. And what about a cube? If we have a cube, I'm trying to draw it fairly neatly. Same kind of a thing. The only thing that matters is the outside of the cube, not the inside. So I don't want the volume. The volume would be length times width times height. So if this is the length, this is the width, and this is the height, when I do a volume, I'd multiply those three things together. I don't want the volume. What I want is the surface area. How do you get the surface area of a cube? Well, let's think about it carefully. If I take this face, this front face, and I find the area of the front face, well, that's length times width. And of course, the back face is the same. So there's a front face and a back face. Each one is length times width. So there's two of those. And then I've got this side face over here. His area is width times height. So width times height 
And of course, I've got two of those, a left face and a right face. So there's two of those. And then finally, there's the top and the bottom, the top face and the bottom face. And what are they? That's, um, let's see, that would be, uh, uh, length times height, I believe. Okay, so each face, you find the area and you add up all the six faces together. Now, that's for a general box, a rectangle box or whatever shape box you have. What we care about is a cube. Cube just means every side is the same length. So it makes it easy. The surface area for a cube is the length times the width, the area of a, of a square. But since there's six faces, you just multiply it by six because each face is the same area. Now, again, if this were a rectangular box where not all the sides are the same, then you'd have to do the, you know, find the area of every single face and add all six together. Here, every face is the same size. So just find the area of one of them, length times width, and multiply by six. So these are the two you'll need to know. Depending on the question, I could be asking, what's the power radiated by the sun? So you have a sphere. Or I may say you have this metal box of a certain size, then you'd use the surface area of a cube. Okay. And of course, in reality, there's other shapes. There's you know, uh, cylinders, there's uh, cones, and there's weird shapes that are not nice and geometric. We don't care about that. We're just doing the fundamental stuff, the basics. And so sphere and cube are sufficient for us. The last term, T, temperature, obviously. And so the hotter the object, the more it can radiate, the more extra energy it has to give away. And you see it in your everyday life. If you've ever done barbecue and you have charcoal, you like the charcoal, eventually it starts to glow red because it's hot. Even though you don't see the fire, but you see the glowing embers, well, that is because the charcoal is very, very hot. So the electrons are very excited. When they drop back down to their lower energy state, they send off light. And that light just happens to have the energy that our eyes can see as red light or orange light or whatever color you see. So the bigger the temperature, the more energy can radiate. Now, here's what's important. Notice in my equation, this is T, not delta T. What that means is, whereas all the equations we've been doing so far have had delta T in them, this does not. So I have to convert to Kelvin. I cannot use Celsius anymore. Conduction, I was lucky because we had uh, you know, it was a K A delta T over L. So it had delta T in it. And calorimetry, uh, CM delta T, it had delta T. And what we remember is that a change in temperature for Kelvin is the same as a change in temperature for degrees Celsius. But now we have an equation that's not the change in temperature, but just the absolute temperature. And so, I have to convert to the correct units for physics. And that means whenever you have a temperature and a problem for radiation, convert it to Kelvin. And just to remind you, if you forgot, the Kelvin temperature is the Celsius temperature plus 273. Okay, so if I tell you, you have a, a metal sphere that you heat up to uh, 800 degrees Celsius, well, when you go to plug the numbers into your equation, you just add 273 to that 800, and that'll tell you the temperature in Kelvin. And it's the Kelvin temperature you used, not the Celsius. But there you go, that's it. That's our equation. If I wanna know the power radiated by some object, I need to know how hot is it? What's its temperature? 
its size, its surface area, and what kind of material are we talking about? How good does it radiate? If we have those things, then we can plug it into this equation with this constant, and we'll have our answer. So let's try an example. Example. You have a metal sphere whose radius is 20 centimeters. Um, if you heat it up, to 1000 degrees Celsius and it's a perfect radiator. Calculate the power by radiation. So this is a nice, typical, basic radiation problem. We have an object. We're going to heat it up to a certain temperature. We know how big it is. And we want to know how easily or how much energy it radiates per second. So obviously, the equation, the power, Q over T, is sigma epsilon A T to the fourth. So I need all these numbers. Well, I know sigma, that's easy. That's 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight. I know epsilon. I'm told in this problem, it's a perfect radiator. And a perfect radiator means epsilon equals one. Now I need A, I need the surface area of this thing. Well, this is a sphere. And I know the surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. So four times pi times the radius squared. However, the radius is given as centimeters and centimeters is bad units. I have to convert to meters. So it's 0.2 meters squared. And so now I just get my calculator 0.2 squared times four times pi gives me 0.503. So 0.503. Lastly, I need the temperature. I know the temperature. Just let me know what time you gotta go. Uh, the temperature I need in Kelvin, I'm given Celsius. So I say 1000 plus 273 to get it into Kelvin. Well, that's easy, that's 1273 Kelvin. So 1273, and that's raised to the fourth power. And there we go. I've got all the numbers from my equation. All I have to do is plug all of this into my calculator and I'll get my number. So I say 1273 raised to the fourth power times 0 0.503 times one, times 5.67 raised to the minus eight. And I get a total power of 74897.04 watts. And that's how we do this type of problem. So far, of course, this is the basic example. It does get slightly more complicated, which we'll go through, but the basics is right there. You're given information, you have a particular equation to use, make sure everything's converted correctly, meters for distances, Kelvin for temperatures, things like this. Plug all the numbers into your equation and you'll get your answer. So are there any questions about this particular example?
all right, well, where does it go from here? Uh, there's not that much more actually, which is good news. Uh, one thing we can do, of course, just as is true with all physics. Wait, I have a, I have a question real quick. Yeah, what's up? So it, if it's not a perfect radiator, it will tell us what the radiator is. Like, yeah, it may say like something it. like uh, this object radiates at 65%. And so, okay, so then would it would be 0.65. Perfect. Exactly right. Okay. That's right. Any other questions? All right. Well, like I said, as is true with all the physics equations, although this equation is the power equals blah, 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 blah. Obviously, you can manipulate the equation to solve for something else. So maybe the question could be, how hot should the sphere be such that it radiates 100,000 watts? Well, then you now know what Q over T is, 100,000, and you're solving for T. All right, this, I mean, this is basic, but just know that although the equation says what it says, I may ask you one of the other unknown or one of the other variables. Or I may say, uh, how much energy will the star radiate after one day? Well, in that case, you're not looking for the power, you're looking for Q, the energy. And you know T, the, the time. So you just move the T over to the other side and you solve for Q. Okay, so just know that while this example shows you how to solve for the power, obviously you could solve for any one of these variables. But it's just a matter of manipulating the equation to get the uh, unknown it is you're looking for. The other way this can be complicated, it's not complicated, but you can complicate it, is what if what you have is, well, let me put it to you this way. If you remember with heat conduction, I said, let's say you have a window and on the inside of your house, it's nice and warm and on the outside, it's very cold. Well, in that circumstance, the heat from inside your house really wants to be sent off to the cold part because the cold part is missing heat. It wants that heat. And so there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of kind of potential for that heat to want to transfer over to the cold spot. However, if your example is that the inside of your house is at 70 degrees and the outside is at 68, well, now there's not really a big temperature difference. And if the temperature difference isn't all that much, then there's not a lot of force trying to push that heat to the other side. So you won't transfer as much heat per second as if there is a big temperature difference. Well, the same is true for radiation. If what I have is this sphere, let's say a star, and it's out in outer space, well, that's different than if I had the same star and it's right next to another very hot star. Well, if they're both very hot, then there's not really that much trying to want this, this radiation to escape to the other thing. There's not as much pressure trying to drive the heat out. And so one thing we may have to do if our, if our problem has it is talk about what about the temperature of the environment? So I could have a metal sphere, for instance. Here's my metal sphere. And it's at a temperature of 1,000 degrees. And then I could have a metal sphere that's at 1,000 degrees over here. Well, let's say this one is in a refrigerator whose temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. And this one is in a box, an oven, whose temperature is 900 degrees Celsius. Well, there's going to be a big difference in how much energy is released out of the sphere into the refrigerator then out of the sphere into the oven because the oven is almost at the right temperature. Once it's at the same temperature, there's no more heat transfer. 
But in the refrigerator, there's a lot of heat you could send out into the refrigerator to try to heat it up to 1,000 degrees. So there must be a way to take this equation and modify it a little bit to account for this type of thing. And so that's what we'll talk about next time. Just to foreshadow it, it's not a big thing, but basically it'll be, instead of t to the fourth, you'll now have t of the object minus t of the environment, each one to the fourth power, okay? And so this is a modification of the original equation, which you only need if the problem tells you about the environments or the background temperature. In our example, I didn't say anything about the environment's temperature, so we don't care about it. We pretend it's space, which is zero. But maybe I give you an example where, like I said, I put it in a, a, in a hot box or I put it in a refrigerator or something. And so now you know the temperature of the background. Then you have to use it to calculate the new power radiated. Okay. And so that's going to be our plan. Next time, we'll do some examples and we'll talk about this modification. And probably examples again on Monday. Okay, once that's done, then we're finished with all the topics. Uh, it would be, yeah, question? And so you're saying this particular equation is used when, uh, when you have, when someone is asking, when a question is asking you about the environment? That, uh, that's one way it could be used, but really it's exactly like this example here, but I would have included information like you place this metal sphere uh, in an oven whose temperature is 750 degrees. So you'll know, you'll have an extra piece of information in your problem that tells you about the environment's temperature. If you don't see that information, then you don't need the modification. You just use the straight up basic radiation equation like we did here. But in another question, I can add in extra information which talks about the background temperature. That's when you use the second equation instead, okay? Now, one way of thinking about it is this second equation is the real one. And in questions like my example here, we assume we put it out in space where we say the temperature in the environment is zero. And so the second term, the T environment is just zero. So it goes away and you're left with the original equation. That's one way of thinking about it. But I just like to say, if you don't have a background temperature, then you use this equation. If you do, then you use this black equation. So what are we looking into the future for? Examples next time and how to use this modification and same for Monday. Once that's done, we finish all the topics for thermodynamics. So that Wednesday, Wednesday of next week, we'll do uh, a test review, an exam review for our first test. Uh, I'll go over all the material we've covered, give you a chance to ask me questions, do work examples, however you wanna do it. And then Friday of next week, we'll have our first test. And again, that'll be online, working the same way as you do your homework submission. Uh, and of course, that means we won't be meeting Friday uh, because you'll be working on your test instead. But that's kind of where we're going. So Friday and Monday, this Friday and next month and this coming Monday, we'll work examples for this stuff, make sure we understand radiation. Wednesday of next week, exam review. Friday of next week is the exam. All right, so that's all I really have for you today. Um, you're free to go. Uh, if you have any questions for me, you can ask. But other than that, I will see you next time. Uh, I, I got one more thing. I, I was just trying to remind you that uh, I, I got a track meet on Friday. Uh, uh -huh. My coach my coach is going to send out uh, a notice or whatnot. But I want to know what the next lecture for Friday be. Um, will it be recorded? Yeah, yeah. Just like all of them. Uh, once they're recorded, I get it onto YouTube and then I post that link onto the 
module section on Canvas. So okay. uh, right Thank now you. they will be updated, but the one on Friday will be there too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure.